Welcome to the Humans of Hospitality podcast. I know so many of you listening to this show love your local bar, your local restaurant, maybe your local hotel, and have so many fond memories of time in hospitality businesses. This is the podcast where we get to chat to the human beings behind the scenes of that industry. Maybe the chefs or the bakers or the coffee roasters or the gin distillers or the craft brewers or the entrepreneurs, but all doing an amazing job of making sure the hospitality stays interesting and the big dull formulaic brands do not take over our high street please enjoy the show In this week's conversation, I am chatting to James Wettler from Cabrito Goat Meat. Now, James realised that goat meat had the potential when his roast goat leg with lentil, salsa verde and chai flowers flew off the menu at the River Cottage Canteen around eight years ago. Soon after, James sold his first kids to one of the great British chefs, Jeremy Lee, at Quo Vadis. And since then, his customer base has grown to include more and more award-winning restaurants restaurants across London and the country. And with Goatoba, he wants hundreds of other venues to include goats on the menu. In fact, Cabrito has a global vision to inspire every meat eater from Europe to India and Australia to America to put goat on their shopping list at least once a month. But why should we and why don't we do that now? Well, in this fascinating conversation, we explore all things goat. As you'll hear, it's down to a very strange quirk of history, which has led to millions of billies needlessly disappearing. But if James has anything to do with it, that will change in the next 10 years. Goat is ready to make a big comeback. I found this conversation utterly mind-blowing, and I very much hope you enjoy it too. So, uh, James Cabrito Goats, thank you so much for sparing the time to, uh, my to have a conversation. Ha- happy to do it. Good. I can't wait to learn about goats and all things goats. But before we start, can you just explain where in the world are we? How long have you been here? Uh, we're in Axminster in Devon, sat in my kitchen. Uh, and Axminster is a small town in East Devon, um, which is a small old market town. It's, it's mentioned in the Doomsday Book. Um we, my, one of my best friends from school lives next door. One of my other best friends from school lives over the road because we all grew up in Lyme Regis, which is just across Amazing. the border. None of us can afford to live there anymore. So wow. we've all, so Axminster was a town that was kind of dying, an old market town. I remember when I was really small, like my son's age, he's four. My mum used to come over here uh, on a Thursday, which was market day. And she put me on a post, which is, which is now the car park over there, which was the marketplace. She stuck me on a post with all the farmers. Then she'd go and do a sort of 20 minute shopping and then come back and pick me up. And sort of mid eighties, the market closed down and Axminster really started, started to die. Um, but because we've all been forced out of living in Lyme Regis, it's suddenly had this rebirth of all these sort of families my age have all moved to Axminster. And it's kind of a, it's a nice little town with some nice little independent shops. The layout of the town's quite quirky, so it doesn't really lend itself to sort of big chains um, because it still has this big kind of market space in the middle of it. So it's it's not, doesn't have one shopping street. So it, it it's retains some uh, independence and I, I, I love it. I love living here. Nice, good. Yeah, it's a very cool part of the world and we're in a really cool space, typical kind of uh, chef's a kitchen and there's yeah. even a even a, a pig's leg which you were saying has been hanging up for a couple of years ready yeah. to carve into and have a nibble if we get peckish yeah so. a friend of mine raises pigs on a really small scale he's got like 30 outside in a couple of pens and we buy maybe half a pig every six months and that one's been hanging above our heads for the last two years and i got it down just before christmas nice i'm glad i didn't bring the dog in now you're definitely <laughs> right he would have yeah. uh, he would have, he would yeah, have enjoyed and that and yeah. all the kids toys yeah it's no, no, just no, been a bit of a mess good. so um your background you were a chef i understand is that right i you was just... yeah i mean like i said i grew up in lime regis right and the thing about Lyme Regis is it's a it's a tourist town. So when you're a kid and you're trying to get your first sort of pocket money job, the the options are clearing glasses and plates in pubs slash restaurants, or working in kitchens, or you know working in fast food places. And I did all of those things. So my first proper job, sort of over the summer, was deep frying fish and chips in a in a place down by the Cobb in Lyme Regis. And the other jobs that I've had just kind of peeling potatoes and and washing dishes and it's not 
if you're a KP, you get, you know, sooner or later you're getting fish and then you're peeling onions and you're peeling potatoes and then someone doesn't turn up for lunch, like for their job and you end up doing cold starters and that's how you kind of make your first kitchen job. Coupled to that was the deep frying fish and chips thing, which is, I mean, Lyme Regis in the summer is absolutely packed. It's mental. Like, and there are places down there that do, that have you know, fish and chip shops that have queues going around the corner. And I used to absolutely love being busy i mean it was it was just sausage and chips burger and chips fish and chips pizza and chips pie and chips i mean absolute garbage but i was 13 14 didn't know any different and you're deep frying fish and chips and the thing that i really enjoyed was seeing the the check board we had this board with nails in it that you'd stick the checks to and i used to love it when it was full because there's a special kind of intensity in a really busy kitchen and i loved that feeling and that stuck with me and that is still stuck with me. And one of the, and sort of taking that when you do your first sort of in another job, when you're doing cold stars and stuff and you still have that busyness of a really loaded Saturday night. And I still love that feeling. I mean, I, and I, that's one of the things that really drew me into chefing was that kind of that really intense Friday, Saturday night when you're in the weeds and there's only one way out of it and that's to bust it and the kitchen all working together and a real camaraderie and that those are the things that I really loved. And, one of the only things I miss about cooking full time now is that Saturday night. If I could find a job that would just let me come in and cook Friday, Saturday night, I'd be more than happy to do that. Can you commute? <laughs> <laughs> I could got, probably do. I've, got, given... I've got a restaurant on the beach where we get exactly that. I'm in awe of the chefs. When the sun comes out in the summer, we're right on the seafront in yeah, Bournemouth. Yeah, yeah. And uh, exactly that. And and the speed, I, I kind of figure my chefs start to see in binary. It's like being in the Matrix when the, yeah, the chefs are exactly full. Right. And, yeah, and the yeah. speed that they can, you know, I, I used to jump on the pass and kind of help out doing yeah. the sort of just, you know, plate it up and make it look pretty bit. And uh, and all of a sudden, you know, when it was proper kicking off, head chef would step in, elbow me out the way. Yeah. And he'd just be going, like, he was five or six checks down the list, kind of putting yeah. stuff out based not just on on what was in order, but well, what that's was the, the real, stuff the real, the real skill, I think, of running a pass on a Saturday night is being able to see clumps of clumps of checks and going yeah. right let's do that one that one that one and then we'll do that one that one that one and then we'll yeah. do that one that one that one and yeah. that I think is the skill of running a pass is being yeah. able to see right you've got I don't know you've got three pies and three pastas yeah. spread over nine checks all in different places and pulling those all together getting them out yeah. but also not doing that and not making sure that you're not leapfrogging tables that are sat next to each other. So the, so the restaurant yeah. actually works and people don't get stressed out. They're waiting longer than people that were there before them. So that's good that you recognize that. Cause that's the classic feedback I always get from table saying, you know, we sat down before this table yeah, and they got the yeah, food yeah, first yeah, and you want to take them into the kitchen. And yeah, you know, that's one of the reasons that I, I have these conversations because Sunday breakfast is the other one where we get feedback kind of like, you know, I sat down at 1130 and couldn't order breakfast. We stopped breakfast at 1130 and you want to take them into the kitchen and say, there's 85 people who've already <laughs> ordered at 25 past 11 yeah, it's going to yeah, take time we to used to get out. that when i worked at river cottage over the road in the in the canteen we'd do yeah. breakfast on a sunday from from nine to half eleven and then yeah. start service for lunch at yeah, 12 sunday roast. you've got just about enough time to cook the yorkshires in that time exactly. and everything else being prepped while you're doing 100 for breakfast yeah it's like it's, it's yeah. insane there should be um maybe i'll do a, a podcast although it probably needs video just to show people what that's like and it's it's a great buzz and it's a great just stop motion stop motion yeah gopro in a camp in yeah. a in a like 9 p.m 9 a.m to 9 p.m on a sunday that's it yeah. but i think it's what is odd to me is that the sort of with the saturation of tv coverage of cooking and chef programs mm. that people's understanding of that kind of thing hasn't really changed yeah. like from a customer point of view people call themselves foodies which is a terrible term that means nothing and but their actual understanding of, oh, I guess they need time to clear up because they've got a restaurant full and they've probably got all these bookings on a Sunday. People's yeah. understanding of it just hasn't changed. No. And that's the classic pinch point because Sunday roast is a fairly intense, you know, there's a number of ingredients. Breakfast has got a number of ingredients on the plate and you think just the change in the kitchens. Anyway, we're going into uh, into a level of detail yeah, where some yeah, people sure, might yeah, have nodded yeah. off yeah. already. Yeah. But, we're not talking uh, about goats. <laughs> yeah, not yet. <laughs> um, but how far did you take that? You ended up um, going, you, you presumably moved on from frying fish and chips and yeah. ended up in restaurants. I travelled for a while when I was sort of in my early 20s and then came back to the UK and decided I needed to get a job and I just thought what did I what was the thing I really liked and I couldn't get away from that idea of really liking that buzzy kitchen feeling so I moved to London where some friends were working in a pub and got a job as a sort of junior cook um you know when you, the sort of the sort of position where you're just you do what you're told and you know and that and that was great and I worked I worked in one place for four years and kind of got better and better and better and then moved on and the two best jobs I ever had cooking were at the Eagle in Farringdon, yeah. which was the first ever gastro pub, um, which is an extraordinary place to work with and with such kind of 
food heritage, sort of British food heritage, one of those sort of rarest of places that actually is British and was uh, frontline in innovation in cooking and has stayed true to what made it famous in the first place. Um, and then I moved from there because some people that owned the Eagle also had a hand in Great Queen Street. So when that opened, I moved there and I was sous chef there for three years. And those were the, my two favorite cooking jobs. The, the Eagle, because it is, like I said, it has this kind of, it has this heritage, which I which I really believe in, that it, why there isn't a blue plaque outside the door and why Mike Belbin doesn't have an MBE, I do not understand because the Eagle changed British dining and has been more influential probably than anyone else, I would say, because it opened, because it made the gastropub movement. Mm. Back at a time when Britain didn't really have a reputation for food at that time. Yeah, right? I mean, it's, it's no French. reputation at all. I mean, this is pre-St. John Explosion, pre-River Cottage, pre-River Cafe. And those like River Cottage, River Cafe and St. John are probably the three things that you think of when you think of that sort of British food renaissance at the start, maybe Neil Yard as well, sort of from a producer point of view. But the Eagle was fundamental in all of that because it started the gastropub movement and you cannot move for gastropubs now. And the democratisation of eating out, you know, that it stopped being something that upper middle class people did and it's something that everybody could do. Um, so why he doesn't have a blue pack and some sort of recognition, I do not understand. Um, so I worked there and that's, I think, I'd worked in kitchens previously before that, but that's where I really felt like I learned how to cook because there is a, there's a line in the Eagle cookbook that says the sort of, the mantra of the Eagle is buy the best products you can and don't fuck with them. And that is David Eyre, who was the other, Mike Belbin and David Eyre opened it. Mike Belbin did the front of the house, David did the kitchen. And that was David's mantra to everyone. You buy the best products you can and don't fuck with them. And that, I think, is the best advice you can give to I think any that's chef. That's a simple bit yeah, of advice. Yeah, totally. Buy the best tomatoes. Absolutely if you're going to buy tomatoes, buy the best ones. And then cut them in half, dress them, and serve them. And if, you, if they're not good enough to do that, don't buy them. Uh, you know? and, that's, and that's kind of the, the gastropub trade off was we will give you restaurant quality food but you'll sit in fairly shabby surroundings. You won't have a tablecloth. You won't have a wine glass. You'll order at the bar yourself, but it'll be a lot cheaper than eating out in a restaurant. So, and I, that's kind of the cooking that I kind of felt drawn to. I've never really felt drawn to the, I have, you know, mountains of respect for people that can do, you know, 20 hours, five days a week and turn out Michelin star food that has a lot of sort of quite intricate techniques put into it. And I have eaten that food and love it and, but that's not what I was interested in cooking myself. I think you have to have a certain type of sort of uh, brain to to enjoy that. Not the long hours, because everybody does long hours, but the sort of the technique and the and the the artistry involved in that. And I was much more like on the other end of the spectrum. And you can see from all the cookbooks, they're they're not sort of the high end ones. They're they're you know the Nigel Slaters and the River Cottages and the yeah. You know, the, the, the less less technical focused, more product focused cooking. Um, so that so I did that job and and that I think that's where the eagle and that's where I really felt like I learned how to cook properly. Um, and then I went to Great Queen Street, which is a very similar type of food, just with a slight with a bit more refinement. It's kind of it's more restaurant than gastro pub, but it still has that gastro pub feeling. So I yeah, and I really enjoyed that. And that was where the Great Queen Street was really quite fundamental to what I do now because the the idea of Great Queen Street was that we used to buy half a cow, two lambs and a pig a week. And that would basically be your meat menu. And you'd butcher it up and work your way through the animals. And there would be a specials board for the odd bits and that kind of stuff. And at Great Queen Street, I learned that there was a, a, a supplier method to get your product in, which involved a van, the back door of the restaurant and a whole animal. Mm -hmm. You know, and Tom Jones, who's probably the best, who does the best beef in the UK, um, who supplies all the kind of restaurants that we do. He does brilliant lamb and brilliant mutton and hogget and uh, and brilliant beef and Dexter's and stuff. And he supplies St. John and sort of all the people we do. But he had his own farm in Wales and he'd drive the animals up. And so there was, so I knew that that sort of route to market existed. Um, and I also had a good understanding of the London restaurant scene because I worked in it. And you know, all that information didn't have any value until I ended up with a, with a goat business where it did. And I think that's one of the, if you're interested in things that have changed in food in the last 20 years, you know, from a chefing point of view, when I first started at the, at the Lansdowne, which was my first job, your meat and fish supplier was an answering machine. So you'd phone them up and you'd say, I want this, 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 and this. 
you wouldn't mention the where it was from. You wouldn't mention the province. You'd say, okay, I want, you know, four pork bellies and a and a strip loin of beef, and you'd get what you were given, and you wouldn't really ask where it was from. Now, your supplier is someone you know on first name terms. You've probably been to the farm. You have WhatsApp conversations with them through the week. I I have, you know, all of my everybody I sell to, I've got their mobile phone number, and I am I am the goat man. And Tom is the, you know, the beef and mutton man. They're not faceless companies with answering machines and, you know, customer service. They are actually people with who are doing the job. So you've cut out a lot of middlemen. The chefs have much more confidence in where their product's coming from. They can sing about it on the menus. They can talk to the waiting staff who then pass that message on to the diners. So the diners are becoming more educated. They maybe understand a little bit more why it's 22 pounds and not 16 pounds, you know, so... That I think is one of the big changes and one of the really positive changes in, yeah. in cooking. And why do you think we've had that? Because you know this podcast is called the Humans of Hospitality for exactly that reason. There are so many incredible people, you know, individual people like you say with mobile numbers. Because who those actually love because it, those so. pork bellies and that strip loin I was ordering were shit. Yeah, <laughs> that's, you know, good, so, and that's, yeah. that's all there is to it. Yeah. And there are people like Tom and other people doing similar things to him. You know, the people that supply Temper and St. John and all that, there are guys that have looked at the market and thought, my stuff is better than their stuff. You know, and they have realised that this huge and exploding London restaurant industry offers a route to market that means that they can actually charge a premium for their product because they're talking to people who care. So that, you know, the pe- it is... You know, it's a horrible term, but brand values and shared brand values. And that's one thing that large corporations talk about all the time. You know, we buy Nike shoes because they stick up for Copernicus. Oh, what's his name? The, yeah, know Cap- the, you know what I mean? Cap- I know the chap you mean. Capernic- yeah, you know, with those kind of ideas of brand values. We buy yeah. this product because we believe mm. in what they believe in, you know. And that is true on a scale, on a much smaller scale when it comes to chefs. So chefs look at what I'm doing and think it is absolutely insane that we're knocking these billies on the head and throwing them in the bin. I want to stop that happening. And whether that's conscious or subconscious, they're going, that's an ethical product. I'm going to buy it because I believe in that guy's ethics. Yeah. And the same is true with with all of these suppliers that are all doing great things that are finding markets in these um they're finding markets in these restaurants. They're saying, we're doing it better and we're doing it with a lower impact on the planet and you can have absolute confidence in the product. And the chefs are going, that's what I want my restaurant to say when it's when I'm out there and I want to be able to put, you know, Welsh blackface, Tom Jones, Welsh, black, Welsh blackface lamb or Cabrito goat. I want to put those words on my menu so people understand that I give a shit about the product I'm putting on the plate. <laughs> So that I think is that I think is why it has happened, and that and that I think that leads. If you're, as it sounds like you are, you're interested in what that means on a wider scale. So, if you think about my own personal position, I started as a chef twenty years ago. I'm now a food producer. I was a chef for fifteen years, and I got to a point where my feet hurt, my back hurt. You know, I didn't want to do 70 hours a week. We've now got two small children. It wouldn't be fair on my partner to be working five nights a week and every weekend. So I was looking for something else to do. So I got, I left the chefing industry and got spewed out into the workforce. And what did I do? I became a producer who took those values that he'd learned in the kitchen about caring about where your food comes from and then transmits that into the food business that he has. That is happening across cooking. So there are chefs that have got to 40, which I think is about the cutoff point. If you've not become an owner of your own place or a head chef or an executive chef, the chances are you will leave and do something else because for all those reasons I just explained. And those people are going out into the workplace and with the values that they built up over 15 or 20 years about trying to create a better food system and putting that on the plate and then talking about it. And they're doing that in executive roles. They're doing that in producer roles. They're doing that in sales roles. So there is this generation of chefs that are going out there and making a positive change. And they're not working for small companies like me. They're working for big companies like Waitrose and Tesco's and Dalehead and, and Tulip and, you know, and even in things like Oaxaca and, you know, and saying, well, we're going to have to make this product better because I'm not comfortable with with putting battery chicken in a in a thing that's got my name on it or that I've worked in. So let's try and find a, a better way. And there and that I think is positive incremental change in the food system that's being led from people like me leaving and going into sort of leaving 24 hour, seven days a week chefing and going into sort of more sort of nine to five roles, but still in food. Mm, that's a really good explanation and, and super positive because um 
yeah, it's exciting to know then that the trajectory is positive. Like you say, there are a lot of people who will have been in cooking in the last 20 years when there's really been a transformation in Britain. And you're absolutely yeah. right. You know, staying on the pass is, is bloody hard. It's so it's nice to know that they're finding a niche. There's that classic um, sort of slight cliche, but you can't join the dots until you're kind of looking backwards rather than forward. So your journey, I'm sure you didn't imagine 20 years ago you were going to end up as no. a goat farmer in Axminster, but it, but it just close, shows the importance of... Uh, yeah, and I'm not saying that's going to happen overnight. No. But that is the... Uh, you know, I was. I think that the the last fifty or sixty years since sort of the end of the Second World War to the end of the nineteen nineties will be seen as an anomaly in history of the way that we changed the food system and completely industrialized it. And that is a that is now a large baked in part of how we eat in the world today. But there are, I think, I think in the last stretch of history, in the next 200 years, we will look back at that period as the anomaly. We will need to now work back, like slicing chunks off of that to bring it back to where it needs to be, which is less monoculture, less large agribusiness, more small scale farming. What, it's a very simplistic way of putting it, but what we need is, what we need is smaller farms, but lots more of them because they're, each individual one of those farms has less impact than a larger, large-scale agriculture farming the same amount of land, less, less need for reliance on uh, fertilisers, less need for reliance on large agricultural machineries, less, basically less carbon inputs. Mm. So that, I think, is, the, that is where we're starting to go. And that is not just driven by a need to save the planet. It's a, it is driven by a need for, it is driven by a need to produce more, better quality food, because as people's food education increases they're going to be less um uh they're going to let be less tolerant of the rubbish products that are churned out by large agricultural businesses mm. you know? i was having this conversation with my son who's 11 just literally a couple of days ago trying to explain to him you know the, the the speed of change even from when i was a kid and there was still a bit of rubbish around but now that kind of reliance on high, highly processed food which they just think is the norm and kind of saying look Organic food didn't used to be called organic. It was just called food. You know, it's yeah, just yeah, how yeah. we used to grow food. We've now had to come up with these labels for food as it used to be. And I said, look, I hope you're going to be... Raw milk does my head in. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, yeah. it's just yeah. milk. Yeah, you know? yeah. And you, you really hope... I said, that this is going to be your challenge. I said, you're not going to be happy feeding your kids the kind of crap that you as a child wants to eat. I guarantee you. Yeah. So your challenge is going to be, how do we fix this and how do we re-educate? And, uh, and it's nice to know. I'd love to think, and, and I hope that the trajectory is back into a more traditional approach. Um, but at the same time, you've got people in technology work working on kind of, you know, growing fake meat in, in test tubes and all that kind of stuff or using insects for uh, for protein. So there's a whole other part of people yeah. looking at how do we feed people on planet Earth going in a different direction. So, But it's why I love this industry. It's it's fascinating. Everybody at the end of the day eats and drinks so, and, and, and everybody's got an opinion or maybe, um, or maybe it, too many people don't have one and they just buy what they see on the shelf. It's a political <laughs> act, as Michael Pollan said, you know, yeah. buying food is a political act, eating food is a political yeah, act. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this is the point. Again, one of the taglines of the podcast is, you know, where we spend our money has an impact on the world we're going to live in. So, you know, consciously yeah. spend it, you know, and decide where you're going to spend it because that is fundamentally what's going to support it. But just coming back then to your trajectory, sure. so you, um, you, what's the trigger? You leave London at some point and come back to Axminster. How did, yeah, you, end, how did off, you end up back I got here? knocked off my bike uh, <laughs> really? on, a, on the King's Road and broke my collarbone. Couldn't work for six months. And Sushi, like- my, my partner, uh, was finishing her uh, master's degree at SAS. She did the anthropology of food master's degree at SAS. Right. So she's the brains and I'm the muscle, basically. <laughs> yeah. um, and so I, got, I couldn't work for six months and she finished the dissertation and we thought, well, you know, if I go back to work in London, I'll probably, that'll probably be it. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll stay here for a long time. And then Sushi will find a job and before we know it, we'll be living in London. But during that time of not working, I brought her back here a few times in the summer and, you know, a nice day. And she goes, oh, this is nice. Well, yeah. we could live here. This is where I grew up. Perfect. So Where's she from? She's from Leicester. So, okay. you know, yeah. every day she goes to work at River Cottage and thinks, wow, this is amazing because yeah. I grew up in urban Leicester. Yeah, totally. you know? yeah. I was with Giles Central from Olive's Tower last week uh, recording and he's the same. He said, there's this piece of elastic from Dorset. It doesn't matter where you go and he'd been all over the world, but it totally. kind of, somehow it just kind of sucks you back. Yeah, and because is, it's such a nice place to it's live. Beautiful, I mean, it? yeah. and that's, and it was, and it's also not a difficult decision because I already had, like I said, my, one of my best friends from school is next door and the other one yeah. is over the road. So there was this community that I could slot back into quite easily. Um, nice. And also having River Cottage, the River Cottage HQ is based about five miles from here and then they have a, a canteen in the town square. So finding a job was quite easy as well because, I, as I said, I'd worked in London for 15 years and those kind of chefs don't come along very often in Devon. Yeah, so yeah. they were like, yeah, come away for us. So I did that. And that was kind of the beginning of, of the sort of life that we have in 
in Axminster. But that, I mean, that 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 doesn't explain why we ended up with goats. I was going to say, so yeah. you're, you're, you're in River Cottage. Yeah, that all sounds perfectly normal. And then, yeah, so what's the trigger? What's What, what happened? Well, I was, I Where mean, does goats come from? It was a it was an accident of history. Yeah. Like we, some friends, some friends of some friends of friends have this big house up in uh, Rokeham, and they had a piece of land that they didn't have time to look after, and it had like it was an old, very very old veg patch and very very old paddock that used to feed the house. And Tiffany and John said to Sushi, "Would you like to sort of just look after it for the summer and maybe give us a few veggies and stuff?" And we were like, "Yeah." So we started we went up there and started planting, but the paddock was completely overgrown. And we were both working at River Cottage that time. Sushi got a job there sort of answering the phones as part-time. Now she's, you know, now she runs the bespoke events and has been there for five years or 10 years. Um, but at the time she was like part-time working up there and I was working at the canteen. So we had this paddock and this little bit of land to grow some vegetables. And the paddock was completely overgrown. So we were going we to put pigs on it. But the next door neighbours were trying to sell their land and they said, uh, trying to sell a house. And they said, please don't put pigs on it because we're trying to sell a house. And we were like, okay, fine. So what, other animal do you put on a piece of land that isn't pigs when you want to clear it? Is it goats? And the answer is goats. <laughs> I'm good on it. Yes, yeah. you are. Yeah. A smart man. <laughs> you are. Yeah, and, it, and they have that reputation of being the thing that you, if you want to clear some scrub land, throw some goats on it. So we didn't know where to get goats, but you know, working at River Cottage, there's always someone to ask about something to do with farming. And the guy who sold bread on a Thursday in, in his stall inside the River Cottage market, he... Uh, he had a stall at Taunton Farmer's Market on the Friday. And next to him were Will and Caroline, who made a goat's cheese called Stawley. So he said, oh, I know these people have a goat farm. Maybe you, be able... and we swapped numbers and I phoned Will up. And I went and Will was in Wellington, Hill Farm Dairy in Wellington. He was making Stawley cheese for Neil Yard at the time. And Will, and this is where I think this is quite an interesting and insightful point when it comes to the goat dairy problem, the goat billy dairy problem. Will had built a dairy. Will and Caroline had built a dairy. They designed the cheese. They'd financed the dairy. They'd bought the herd. They'd made their first cheese. They were up and running with their goat milk production. And then they looked around in the barn and thought, shit, what are we going to do with all these billy goats? So I don't know how you can get from sitting down with your idea of starting a goat dairy cheese business and opening your first Excel spreadsheet and, you know, which is the beginning of any business and getting from there to producing your first cheese and then thinking, shit, all these boys, you know? And that shows you just how well, not only is that idea hidden from the consumer, but how well it's hidden from the people that are in the industry. You know, like if you went and asked the guys who were selling goat's cheese at Neil's Yard in Common Garden, what happens to the male billy goats? They'd probably go, uh, I don't know. Mm. So there's this whole, uh, I, I cannot understand how you can, like Will is a really intelligent guy, <laughs> you know, and Caroline is you a- You asked him. Yeah, <laughs> a really intelligent people. And they were like, we just didn't think about it. Yeah. Because nobody, like you obviously go and have asked advice and nobody says, well, you're going to have this billy problem because yeah. nobody talked about it. Yeah, damn so, nature. Yeah, I mean, it's unbelievable. And Will and Caroline were absolutely adamant they will not euthanize these billies, you know. And thanks to that sort of ethical approach from them, we are where we are. Like they, the first year they had, they were just growing the herd, so they had about forty billies, and they managed to get rid of them to petting zoos, and some had gone for you know other bits and pieces. And but the second year, he was like, we're going to have about eighty because they're growing the herd. And then I came along, and he's, and um, so we went up and we got these four goats and we put them on this piece of land and. The they did what they needed to do and they cleared it down and it was perfect. And they're like, come October, I thought, right, you guys have done your job. It's time to put you on the River Cottage menu. And like the thing about River Cottage is they're not, you know, they're not icky about putting something as unusual as it was then, six, seven years ago. Not icky about putting unusual things. I mean, Hughes eating placenta for Christ's sake. So <laughs> putting goat on the menu is easy, no you know. So I put the first two goats on the menu there and the first night they went on, they they outsold the beef and the second night they sold out completely. And I just had a, I just thought, hang on a minute. You know, the, the one good idea I've had in my life was what well, other than asking sushi for a second date was, um, <laughs> hang on a minute there. Will's got this problem. These goats need to be not euthanized. I've just put them on this menu in a tiny town in the middle of East, in the middle of Devon, not some sort of, central London kitchen where you might expect it to sell because it's a more cosmopolitan crowd. But in East Devon on a Tuesday night, we we sold all the portions that we had going. Maybe maybe there is something in this. 
So I went back to Will and told him what happened. And he said, okay, next year we'll keep all of them alive and we'll earmark them for you. And I found a farmer who could rear them. And that was the beginnings of it. And we honestly thought, I honestly thought, bit of extra money, maybe one drive to London a week, you know, maybe sell a few goats, maybe it'll pay for a holiday, you know. And here we are six weeks, six months, six years later. Six years, is it? Okay. Yeah. And what was the dish you cooked that night that sold so well then? Uh, it-, it was lentils. Uh, it was it was roast leg with lentils uh, and salsa verde and some uh, chive, sort of chive flowers. And that was the first thing I ever did. It does sound good, to be fair. At least you didn't just do, you know, goat sandwich or something. It's, yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> it I mean, does if, sound delicious. If you, if you cook at Great Queen Street and you cook at the Eagle and you cook at Lansdowne, your kind of go-to thing with most things is lentils and salsa verde. And I thought that's, you know, you don't, I don't want to curry it because everybody would just thought that's what you're going to do. So I wanted to do it something that was a bit more accessible and, you know, who knows who it was going to turn out. I mean, no idea. And, you know, the the, the, key, the the carcasses were probably 15, 16 kilos and now they're 24 kilos and they're much better quality because we've learned a lot, but they sold and that was all that mattered. And I just thought... You know, I didn't have any grand ideas for it. I didn't think that we would be able to, you know, turn the tanker in the in the British industry and put all these goats into the food industry. It wasn't until, I don't know, it wasn't until I can probably put, can put my finger on it. Maybe two years after that, we thought maybe this is something that we should do sort of full time and and something that was there a particular trigger or particular order or something that, that made no that? i mean the thing the, the story of cabrito has kind of been incremental success mm. rather than it going from you know naught to stella yeah. it john goes, lewis didn't knock on the door and say hey look we'll take 100 a week <laughs> yeah and if they had it wouldn't have it wouldn't have taken off you yeah. know i mean part part of the reason it's success is because it's been slow incremental growth you know we won the observed food monthly award in 2014 that was a step forward that then got us a phone call from Ricardo. That was a step forward. You know, you then get on sort of bigger, bigger menus and you turn up in more TV shows and radio stuff. And those are the kind of incremental steps because what you're doing is as daft as it sounds, we are introducing new food into the UK. You know, I mean, we don't we have any cultural history of eating goat in the UK. It has not featured on any menus at all, really, until we came along. And I mean, it has felt like introducing a new product. And is that is that going back multi-generation as well? I don't know. Was, we, we no culture goats, history. I don't know. No culture history of eating goat in the UK. They were always here, were they? For a thousand years. Yeah. And the reason for that is really straightforward. Yeah. It's the wool trade. Right. So you are, Axminster, where we are now, is is in the Doomsday Book, which is 18, no, 1082, I think it came here. There are 20 goats recorded in Axminster in the, in the Doomsday Book. There's also 20 slaves, six horses, and about eight sheep, I think, um, in the Doomsday Book. What is Axminster famous for? Axminster is famous for carpets. And what are carpets made for? Carpets are made from wool. So you fast forward 300 years, those goats have gone. And what happens in that time is that Britain starts making and exporting an awful lot of wool. And the thing about wool in a pre-mechanized society and a pre-mechanized economy is that it's the perfect thing to export because it's really light. Here comes my son. Yes. I'm in the middle of doing an interview, Woody. <laughs> Movie's finished. Me, because I'm Oh, okay. We might have to timing. pause it a minute yeah, while I change, while I change yeah, the yeah, nappy. Yeah. Just a minute. It's the real world. It yeah. is, yeah. yeah. The glamour of goat meat business. Yeah, goats interrupted. are easier than kids, right? Good work. That was quite quite an impressive time. Well, modern modern answer, man. It's like a <laughs> Formula One wheel change. Yeah, exactly. After That's four years. Uh, that's good skills. Yeah. Yeah. So the wool trade. Yes. Um, pre-industrial society, if you're going to export something, wool is the perfect thing because it is very, very, because very light, but it's very valuable. So you could put a lot in a bag over your shoulder, carry it to market, put a lot on a cart, or we could put a lot on a boat to export it. So the UK started exporting an awful lot of it. it Most of it went to Antwerp where it was woven into carpets and clothes and stuff and sold throughout the rural courts of Europe. So it became... From a farming point of view, monopoly capitalism. Anyone that had any land at all put sheep on it. So if you are a peasant farmer and you are looking for a small ruminant in your back garden to give you milk and to give you meat, what are you going to choose? You're going to choose a goat, milk, meat, or you're going to choose sheep, milk, meat, and fleece. And you'll get five or six fleeces out of a goat's life, which is the most valuable part of the animal. So you had this two value animal versus this three value animal and, and sheep won out. And that became, as I said, monopoly capitalism. You then go forward to 1386, I think, which is the first ever 
book written, first cookbook in the English language called The Form of a Curry. Uh, the only people that are writing anything down are rich. And those people are landowners that eat sheep. So <clears throat> when you start writing the first recipe book in the English language, it's full of sheep recipes. There's only one goat recipe in it, which is called the Brut of Armenia, which is in the book. Mm. Um, and that goat recipe stays the same in the recipe record for about 650 years. It doesn't change. Whereas we keep, there's about 30 goat recipe, uh, sheep recipes in the, in the form of a curry, which was the first book written for the court of Richard II. So into the, into the recipe record and therefore into British food culture is inserted this sheep, this kind of dominant sheep uh, recipes over the goat recipes because of the wool trade, meaning there are loads and loads of sheep. And what happens then is that the only people that can read and write stuff down are rich. Therefore, sheep becomes food of the rich, goat becomes food of the poor, and it's stigmatized. And it stays that way pretty much in Western culture to this day. I mean, even Gandhi called it the poor man's cow. And that was only 80 years ago. And that sort of cultural superiority in food kind of remains to this day. We still think of goat as kind of a third world food, whereas sheep is what we're all used to eating, whether it be mutton or hogget or lamb. So that... I mean, I, you know, my, my partner did the anthropology of food. That is a fascinating little accident of history, which means that we are in the Western, inverted commas, one of the few cultures that doesn't have goat in its in its diet regularly, and it's all because of the wool trade, like Amazing. 800 years ago. I see why you called the goat man. That's some good knowledge there, isn't well, it? Well, yeah, uh, I mean, I, like I said, my, my, my partner did the anthropology of food degree. She's Amazing. the brains, I'm the muscle. Yeah, I'm, yeah, you know. but you've remembered it well. So. Yeah, and, you know, her professor, Harry West, who's just moved to Exeter to start an anthropology of food um, uh, sort of department there, he was the one that we interviewed for the book and sort of learned all that stuff. And... Goat was the first domesticated animal, first domesticated uh, farm animal. Uh, the first domesticated animal was, a, uh, was a dogs and the first domesticated farm animal was uh, goats. They reckon, you know, sort of hunter-gatherers evolving into captive animals is quite easy to imagine. You know, you chase them all day and you get them up against the wall and just fence them off and they're there for the next day. So that kind of domestication process happened uh, in the Fertile Crescent about 10,000 BC. Um, and then you can watch goats sort of move into Europe through the Danube and then down also through the sort of uh, southern tip of the Mediterranean coastline into in sort of Morocco. And then the Moorish invasion into Spain took a lot of goats into Spain. And that's kind of how they've moved, how goats have moved into Europe. Um, so that I, there is that cultural basis of goat is absolutely key as to why a thousand years later, when you're trying to start a goat meat business, you've got no market. You've got no supply, and you've got a thousand years of cultural history against you. Yeah. Sounds like a brilliant business idea. Sounds like so a great where are the hurdles there? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, none of that went into the Excel I, I sheet. Think you work that out later. No, yeah. I mean, yeah, you look back and think, well, yeah, you know, and we that? I, you know, I spent a lot of time in a van on my own, and yeah. wonder, you know, and you think to yourself, why, well, why is this so hard? And then yeah. you like being curiously minded, you dig into it, and sushi sort of academic background, you kind of, you kind of find out the reasons why, and that's the basis, that's the fundamental basis of the book. Yeah, but. That quirk of history is, I think that's amazing. And I'm, I am indebted to Ivan Day, who's the food historian that I interviewed for the book, who wow. sort of who sort of helped me flesh out this theory. I mean, I went to his house up in Cumbria for what I thought was going to be a coffee and a chat. And four and a half hours later, I left. And he amazing. walked out of his library and put this tray down with books on him. And that's every goat recipe in the English language for 800 years. Wow. You know, it's just amazingly generous with his time yeah. and fantastically knowledgeable about British food. And that, so the process of writing the book was also kind of a process of sort of personal discovery for the product that I was selling. And that sort of stuff is really important, I think, Amazing. when okay. you when you do stuff like this. It, it, to contextualise the product as to why we don't eat it, I think helps a lot in the messaging as to why you should eat it. Hugely. Yeah, and that authenticity then of, of actual genuine kind of knowledge and, and your love and desire to do it, I think just grows. I, if you're, totally, you become the invested The harder something is, the, the more fun it is really, isn't it, to try yeah, and make and it and also you like, the, the, the answer as to why we don't eat goat is a quirk of history, mm. not that there is something inherently wrong with the product. Yeah. And that I think is a really important message to say. And, you know, those, those kind of barriers to selling food are becoming easier and easier to sort of get over because we are a much more sort of well-traveled and mm. educated and you know diverse bunch of people which are more open to new food and new ideas and and also more open to those kind of stories you know mm. i mean who wants to listen to a story about how your how mcdonald's make their burgers against how people go out and find these amazing foods in it 
that the sort of the encapsulation of that was, and one of the chapters of the book is based on something that I read Nathan Outlaw say, and it was a real. I mean, one of the it was a throwaway sort of. I think it was sort of New Year's. It was in the New Year's Day Guardian, 2017 or something, and it was what's the best thing you'd eaten in 2016. It was they'd obviously just sent the thing to his PR, and he knocked out a quick sentence. But I thought it was incredibly insightful, and it was. Uh, he said that um, we're only just discovering what we're really good at in the UK. You know, we're and I can't paraphrasing paraphrasing it. We're only just discovering what we're really good at, and that's a really exciting place for British food to be in because we. Are, we lost so much stuff post-war in terms of the, the, the expansion of agriculture into large business stuff rather than small scale producers, you know? And I think Nathan was probably talking about, you know, the Cornish fish and the things that the, like the best Cornish fish and that can kind of rival Japanese sashimi and stuff like that. I think that's probably what he was talking about, but we are a product of that. We are, we are, we are learning how to make the best of these dairy goat billies and turn them into the best product we can. There are, you know, there's, Black Cow Vodka up the road from here who are making you know, pure milk vodka. There's Capriolus who's learning what British what British meat becomes the best British cured hams. You know, there are popping up all over. I mean, there's Trill Farm up the road from here is turning out probably the best fruit and veg and salad leaves in the world. And I genuinely believe that their salad mix is the best in the world. Having eaten at a two-star Michelin restaurant in Alba in uh, Italy that has a 50 leaf salad that has got it two Michelin stars. I've eaten some of their stuff and it's better. Yeah, and, and that is a product of Ashley, for example. His dad was uh, a no dig organic farmer and he's picked it up and, and you know, his dad was the innovator and he's expanded on the innovation and got better at it. You know, and there are, I'm sure there's people out there now with GoMe businesses who think they can do it better than me. And that's brilliant because the more people there are in the business, the more innovation it is, the, the more innovative it is. You know, and that's, that's also the word I think that isn't used enough when it comes to British food and British cooking is innovation. We think of innovation as things that is in the, in the technology industry or in, you know, in cars and in iPhones and in computers. And actually, when you're talking about developing new products in the food system, you're talking about innovation. And that innovation is being driven two ways. It's being driven from the producer and it's being driven by the chef. So the chef, producer brings a new product to the chef and the chef goes, oh, I'll try that, and cooks it, does a dish with it, thinks, well, actually, that could be a little, maybe if I could get the producer to do X, then I could do Y. And they go back to the producer and they say, look, I really like your product, but I need it to be a little bit more like this. Can you do that? Three months later, they go back with it. Yeah, that's great, but maybe we can do. And you know, the the examples of that is definitely us. When we first started, our go carcasses were 15, 16 kilos. Now they're 22, 24 kilos. That is because we've had conversations with chefs who say, I want them bigger. Are they a better flavor when they're bigger? There's more fat in the muscle when they're bigger. They cook better. They behave better when I do this to them or that to them. You know, so we've gone back to the farmers and say, look, product's great. Got loads of people that really want it, but it's got to be a bit heavier. And they're so fine. If you can sell more, I'll make them heavier. That's fine. Um, so that is an example where where we have sort of the the innovation is is producer me and chef there, and together they've said let's make this product better. And mm. that's happening with loads of stuff. I mean, Mang the Mangalisa pigs is another example of that, where they have gone from being kind of a fringe breed to being the one that all chefs want. I think that the people like Warren's down in Cornwall and also Tom, who I've talked about, they've they've improved British beef. Uh, I mean, Tom has basically introduced Dexter's into London on his own. So that is another area where he's gone, oh, I've got this thing that, would you like to try it? Someone like St. John has gone, yeah, I'll try it. St. John found out it's brilliant. And now there's Dexter's all over the place because that innovation has come between chef and supplier. And I think that is a really, you know, circling back to what Nathan said, that is, a, that is what Nathan said about just working out what it is we're really good at doing in the UK, rediscovering that stuff. Mm. That is where I think the excitement in British in British food is. Mm. I mean, there's a guy in Essex that grows saffron, you know, and he's, he's British. British. He's, the company's called English Saffron. David, his name is, and he goes out there and picks it himself with pliers. And like you listen to him, he's so the bees get really drowsy on saffron, so he has to remove the bees with pliers and then pull the wow. saffron out and then put the bees back in. You know, amazing. And we're like, I thought saffron could only grow in, you know, in the Middle East. Yeah. He said, Why do you think it's called saffron Walden? 
because it used to be like and, and another one of these brilliant stories that like we're all really interested in. Yeah. But that is, as I said, that's where the innovation is. And I think that the British British food doesn't get both in the retail the, the and also in the in the development, like the supplier and the restaurant, doesn't get enough credit for that. No, I think we're better at innovating than we are at PR and shouting about it. I think the, the British way has been just to quietly get on with things over the years, really. We've just sort of, you know, that's been in, in our DNA is just to get yeah, on with stuff. Also, but I think also it's the food media's got a big part to play in that. Mm. You know, there's what, Master Chef and Great British Menu, and they're interested in how many chefs they can find to make plates look pretty, and they're not interested in the people behind it who are actually... The, where that innovation comes from, I think yeah. that you know you're after you're after a good 25 minutes of television, not a really interesting story. Absolutely. Yeah, you know. Well, we can't get on TV yet, but at least we can have the conversations uh, <laughs> yeah, with the human beings because there's half well, a dozen people there that I now need to speak to. And there so, it is. Uh, there's there's another. I mean, that's another way that food is innovating. The podcast explosion. It shows. I think. I mean, I've done lots of these podcasts now, and I. Re- I mean, podcasts kind of my medium. I've I always have the radio on much more than TV because I can't sit still for that long. And I think that the pod- podcasts and the demand for them has shown that people are interested in these stories. You know, and the yeah. explosion of cookbooks is another. I mean, wow, well, who'd have thought ten years ago we'd have written a book about goat? Mm-hmm. There's obviously a demand out there for these stories, and people are interested. Yeah, in. and I think it's the only place where you can go into depth. Clearly, the BBC aren't going to do an hour and a half of you and I having a chat about goat because it's maybe not going to be uh, <laughs> not going to go out at nine o'clock on a Saturday anyway. But I no. think people are interested. And the good thing with the podcast is you can listen to it while you're doing something else. So you can be driving your car or walking your yeah, dog yeah, or yeah. cooking. Whereas video takes us, you know know 95 percent of your attention whereas this is probably happening at the same time as something else so that's why i love podcasts it's why we've launched this one is i think the stories are fascinating yeah but i think it's the right medium when i wanted to go one of the triggers for me doing this was when there was the explosion in knowledge around cryptocurrency and i was like where the hell do i go to find out what what is all this about about blockchains and crypto and i've got no bloody idea and i uh, did a bit of research and sure enough you know the, the best people in the world and i can't remember their names but the people who knew the most about how that works had done a couple of podcasts and they're kind of like two hours each so walking the dog down the beach yeah. you know I come back and I'm like the amount that I learned where else you know I haven't I can't read a book whilst I'm walking along the beach and I can't watch video but it's such a great way of having a much more in-depth conversation and yeah, I've, I've done sure. interviews with the BBC and uh, and you get sort of you know they ask you quite a, a relatively intelligent question and then say can you just answer that in 20 seconds and you're like no no it's sort of probably six or seven minutes just yeah, for that and one the thing, I mean I've, was, done a, I've done a bit of TV and you just you do something, it, it sounds really good in your head, and then they ask you to repeat it 15 times. And by yeah. the time you're just like, this is yeah. lost all of its And each time soul. shortening it, and then, yeah. and and then it gets cut lost, to three seconds. It's lost all like, of its soul yeah. by the time so, you actually get to say it. Yeah, it's so. a podcast a bit deeper. So you've touched a few times then on, on the product and the change to product. So again, from a chef's perspective, you know, how does the cut of, of, of goat compare to, to sheep and to cow and all that kind of stuff? Is it, is it, do you have to cook it in a different way? Do you need to treat it differently? Or actually, are we getting to the point where they're comparable? A good rule of thumb is anything you can do with a lamb, you can do with a goat. Right. That then raises the question, why the hell should I buy goat? But the answer to that, I think, is that a lot of the a lot of the uh, recipes and a lot of the dishes that we consider land dishes would be traditionally goat dishes. They just turn up in English cookbooks over the last 30 years. And the publishers have gone, well, I can't put a goat recipe in here because there's nowhere to buy it. So we'd have to anglicize them and make them make them lamb. And I a few years ago I had dinner with I was at a dinner where Claudia Roden was and I was talking to her about, and she said to me, when I first started writing recipes, I would put goat recipes in the book and the publisher would say, you've got to take the goat out. You can have that dish, but it's got to be lamb because otherwise people aren't going to be able to buy it. it. So what you've seen now in the last few years is the reintroduction of goat into recipe books like Gil Meller, who's a friend who lives up the road, probably another one you should see talk to. Yeah, I'm taking notes. He, um, his new book has got a goat recipe in it. Right. You know, and the River Cottage A to Z book, which came out a few years ago, the G is goat or K is kid, one of the two. So you now, there are now, I mean, Gizzy's new book, Slow, has got two, three goat recipes in it. And five years ago, there's no chance they would have had goat in them. So is that because you, it, there's now access to the meat? I've not looked, but can you buy it in the supermarket Yeah, I mean, or? you can buy it online from me and from lots of other people, but you can, and you can buy it in, uh, in, in butchers. I mean, butchers can get pretty much whatever you want as long as you ask. So it is now available in a way that it wasn't maybe five to 10 years ago. Mm. And that, that goes back to what I was saying about feeling like you're introducing a new product into market. You've actually got to, you know, when we first started selling goat, there was no goat meat recipes on the BBC food website. And now there's probably 25. Mm. So you've actually, 
the the sort of progression in in the business in selling more goat meat has also been that sort of media side where you need to, people need to feel comfortable cooking it and for that they go to their cookbooks if those cookbooks don't have any recipes in it they're less likely to buy it if they can see the recipes there they know what to do with it then they're therefore they're more willing to buy it so it's kind of been a whole if you look at cabrito as a whole there's been you know they're getting it into restaurants side and there's been getting it into media side so there's all that sales stuff all that doesn't mean anything if you haven't got any product to sell. Yeah. So the thing that Cabrito gets, if it gets any credit at all, it gets credit for getting goat onto all those restaurant markets, all those restaurant menus, and therefore in, and into the sort of retail areas. What Cabrito, what people don't talk about Cabrito is the back of house stuff, which is the building of the farming network, which for my money is a bigger achievement because that is not about, as I said before, restaurants are really innovative and people are open to new stuff. The back house stuff is you've got a farming industry that's been built up over 30 years that is predicated on knocking all the billies born on the farm on the head the moment they're born. And you have to change that farming industry. You have to get them to invest and to and to innovate because they've got the carcasses better and develop better feeding systems and written animal welfare uh, protocols and written rearing protocols. So all that stuff has happened. No one ever talks about that. You know, that's not the thing that is that anybody ever gives – not – I'm not asking for credit for it, but nobody ever looks at it and goes, oh, actually, there's a whole farming system that's changed there. That, I think, is the bigger achievement of the two, rather than introducing a product which, you know, you, you think you're going to get pretty good pickup on because chefs are open-minded and they've all known that goat exists in a space where it is a food. So it's not like it's, you know, you're not giving people pieces of wood and saying, turn that into it. People know that it is a food and there are places they can go for inspiration to cook it. The back of house stuff with the farming. You're going onto a farm who is got who's got two thousand milking nannies, is euthanizing over a thousand billy goats a year, and saying, "Please don't do that. Keep them alive." And I'm going to sell them by telling people that you have been knocking them on the head and killing them. You know, that's a really difficult conversation to have. And we made loads of mistakes with that messaging when we first started. Alienating farmers, alienating the industry by saying this is terrible, it shouldn't happen, you should be eating this because it's awful. And me just being really stupid and thinking, actually, I probably should be nicer about them because they're supplying my product. You know, and then building that relationship up over time, changing the messaging a little bit so everybody's comfortable with it. And now being able to say, this is what we used to do. And this is what we do now, and this is a really positive story. Yeah, and that the sort of slow six year building of that relationship and building up the stock of the goats has been essential, and it wouldn't have happened any other way. You know, if we'd have gone, if I'd have walked onto a farm five years ago and said, Can you keep a thousand goats alive? They'd have gone, No, of course I can't. But we walked onto a farm and said, Can you keep 50 goats alive? And they said, Yes. And then the next year we went back and got 200. Then we went 400. Then we went 800. And that slow growth meant that the farmer's confidence in us grew at the same rate as the market. And now the farm that's 10 miles away from here, they were the first large scale dairy uh, unit, probably anywhere in the world, to keep all of their billy goats alive. And they all go into the food system. We've got another one up in Preston who I text yesterday. He's got 1,500 milking nannies and 1,000 young animals on the site. He's got more goats up there than he's ever had because he's got 750 animals that he would have euthanized five years ago. So that is a real achievement. And that is, there are, you know, you go onto farms now and there are barns that have been built because of what we've done. There are people with jobs that are because of what we've done. You know, there is an expansion in this industry. There's economic growth in this industry. They're, we're putting 20% on the turnover of the farms because they are uh, keeping all these billy goats alive. And that is a real achievement that isn't glamorous mm. and isn't going to make the headlines like uh, the food headlines, like, you know, getting your uh, getting your dish on uh, into the banquet of Great British Menu, which is what we did last year with James Cochran's amazing sort of goat shoulder dish. That's the stuff that gets all the plaudits. Behind that, I think the bigger achievement is, is bringing these farmers together, getting them to rear the billy goats, getting them to invest, because you're basically doubling their feed bill for the young animals every year. That farming stuff is where the real sort of... Yeah, and, and a real proper collaboration. And, and are they seeing, they've seen a return on that investment, presumably. Is, is the price of goat's meats changed or literally is the demand and supply running in parallel pretty well? Uh, our product is a pound a kilo more expensive than it was when we started six years ago, which is below the level of inflation in food. So um, we, and the farmers make a good return, probably make 30, 35 pounds an animal. So that's, you know, you scale that up to a thousand animals a year. Is that comparable with sheep? Or? 
Uh, I don't know enough about the sheep industry no, to be able to say, but I would imagine it's probably better because the margins on sheep are really tight because people use it as a loss leader in supermarkets and it's a race to the bottom yeah, with most things. And there's a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, and there's a lot of them. And there's cheap imports and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, the, the, the economic incentive for the farms has to be there to do it. Yeah. Otherwise, they're just not going to do it, which is the reason they were knocking them all in the head in the first place. Yeah, and that... I think it's worth just examining the reason why that was happening in the first place and where you apportion the responsibility for that because it's very easy, which is what I did at the beginning, is to say, oh, these farmers are terrible because they're the ones knocking the billy goats on the head. Well, beneath that, you've got to think of the reasons why are they knocking them on the head? They're knocking them on the head because there's no demand. And why is there no demand? Because nobody really scratches the surface of the food system and wonders why this is happening. So... One of the things I always do at the events that we do is, how many people in here have eaten goat? One person out of 50 put their hands up. How many people in here have eaten goat's cheese? And everybody puts their hands up. And you then say to them, okay, so you're eating goat's cheese. That purchasing decision has a consequence. Somewhere down the line, two or three stops removed, there is a dairy producing the milk. And that dairy has got that goat pregnant. And pregnancy has consequences. The consequences of that pregnancy is is goats, baby goats. Nature dictates 50-50 split on what normally is twins. So somewhere from you purchasing that goat's cheese dish or hard cheese in a supermarket, there is a male billy goat being born that's going to be euthanized. And you are responsible for that purchasing. So you can't just say, well, the farmers are terrible because they're producing they're producing the producing the product, they're euthanizing the kids. The retailer is selling it. They have got no interest in telling people where, that there is a dead billy goat at the end of that purchasing decision, so they don't talk about it. The purchaser doesn't isn't invested enough in the food system to think, well, maybe I should not do this or I should do it and then find a solution to offset it. So the farmer's responsible because they're the one who's in the industry doing euthanizing. The retailer is responsible because they're encouraging the growth of this industry without making any effort to solve the problem of the billy goats. And the and the customer is responsible for it because they don't dig hard enough into that system in order to fully understand the consequences of the purchase. And what we say at these events is you can offset that problem. You can, if once a month, instead of buying a lamb product, you buy a goat meat product, the whole problem of the billy goats goes away because the 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 meat system is so enormous. I think the meat system in the UK is worth 2.8 billion, I think. I think might be I think that's right. It's 100,000 milking nannies in the UK. 50% of those are in the commercial sector. There's anywhere between 80,000 billy goats, 80,000 goats being born on farms in the UK being euthanized every year. We kill 116,000 lambs a week in the UK. So the, 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 they're not even comparable in terms of their size of market. Less than a week's worth of lamb supply for goat for an entire year so if everybody that bought goat's cheese went to the shop and thought okay i'll offset my purchasing decision of this goat's cheese which i love so much by buying a kid goat product once a month the problem would go away overnight so we're just trying to say that it's not anybody's fault it's everybody's fault you know and there's an omerta about it everybody knows it's happening but nobody wants to talk about it so if we make this goat's meat products available and people make a conscious and ethical decision to offset the the less good parts of that system, you can do that by buying a packet mm. of goat shanks a, a month and yeah. the problem goes away. Mm. It's fascinating, isn't it? And, and it is just uh, an awareness thing, I think. I just, I don't think people, they don't think about it, they don't know, and it's how you get that information there. Like you say, they're not going to put it on the back of the uh, goat's cheese, are they? And say, totally. yeah, for every one of these you buy. But to their great credit, the goat dairy system, as soon as a viable solution came along, they got behind it. Right. They knew it was a problem. I mean, I've been to enough goat conferences to know the two existential threats to goat dairy are tuberculosis and the Daily Mail finding out they knocked all these billy goats on the head and right. then, you know, it being a terrible splash and turning into the veal controversy all over again, you know? Yeah. They're past that now because they they can say, well, we work with Cabrito and we do as much as the market demands and as the market grows, we hope that one day all of the billy goats will go into the food system and we are trying our hardest to make this happen. Is this, is this uh, UK specific or is this uh, happening on the continent as well? Well, Cabrito at the moment is, well, Cabrito at the moment isn't UK specific because we have trial. Um, I've been working with a project called the Food Heroes Project in the EU, which it's a project funded by the EU to work uh, to find solutions to food waste. And one of the problems that they identified was the billy goats. There's 100,000 milking nannies in the UK, as I said. There's 350,000 milking nannies in the Netherlands, and there's a million in France. Wow. 
So they, those three countries between them are euthanizing 1.5 million billy goats a year. We last year worked, started to work on the development of a goat meat market in the Netherlands and in France with the EU project. And now the EU project funding is coming to an end. So we now have a commercial uh, trial starting in the Netherlands where I've got 200 goats being reared for me and a commercial trial in France where I've got 200 that will be ready for September, October. To sell into the uh, their local market? Yes. Not so we've been here. working with a butcher in Belgium who supplies bunches of restaurants they've been taking some of our product as a trial run all of the all of the chefs have said this is great but we'd really like to use a more local product hence the trial nice. and if that works well then we'll just continue to do what we did what we've done in the uk grow the number of goats with the number of farmers with Amazing. the number of restaurants all at the same rate hopefully so we have a shared history in the consumption of goat in europe basically they had a similar reason that it's not it's not on the, the national dishes i mean everybody 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 established sheep herds because of the wool. Yeah. They didn't establish, I mean, the, the byproduct in that system, oddly, was the meat and the milk. Mm. Um, so, yeah, and that, that, is how we're, that is how the sort of European stuff is progressing. I mean, that is a, a million goats is a lot of it's goats. incredible. You know, it's yeah. a lot of goats, and that would require, you know. <laughs> you'd, you'd need a bigger van. Yes, and, it, and it's a, <laughs> but it, it isn't insurmountable. Yeah. I mean, a million goats is a lot when we're sat on a kitchen table in Devon, but it's not a lot when you look at a larger food system in somewhere like France, which is, you know, like I said, we kill 116,000 lambs a week in the UK, you know, so yeah. no, there's 90 not, million people not in France. Not- and so, so one of the ways you're looking at solving this kind of uh, awareness, I, I, I think, is uh, around goats over or goat over. Uh, can yes. you just explain where did that come I from? Have, and, I know my two jobs. And I mean, one. I'm aware of beer in October, but uh, where are we heading with goats then? Well... There's a company called Heritage Foods that are based in Brooklyn, and they. Uh, I first heard about them where when I read Eating Animals by Jonathan Safran Fur, which I would recommend to anyone listening to this podcast. It's an amazing book. Um, it's predicated on the idea that his son is born in Brooklyn 20 years ago. Can he make the decision for him to be a vegetarian, or does he have to wait for his kid to make that decision on his own? He, being the sort of curious mind that he is, said, I need to know more about the food system in order to make that decision. And he digs into the U- into the US food system. And it is nasty. He really gets some dirt under the nails and it's nasty. The one sort of highlight in that book is Heritage Foods, who are doing free range turkey and free range pork in farms across the Midwest. And then they're shipping it into restaurants throughout the US. Um, there is a woman called there is a woman called Erin Fairbanks who used to was their project director and she was working with Anne Saxelby who's like the queen of cheese in the in the US uh, and Anne Saxelby was working with all these these farmhouse producers and then selling their goat's cheese into the US into the sort of uh, Manhattan and Brooklyn restaurant scene. Aaron Fairbanks was working as project director for Heritage Foods. Those guys were up doing a tour in New England where most of the food was, and they discovered the Billy Prop. And this was eight years ago. And Aaron had this brilliant idea of most of these kids in the farmhouse cheese manufacturing system are born in spring. Fast forward six, seven months, October. That's when the kids will be ready for consumption. She called it, she said, right, what we'll do is we'll get... We'll get the farmers to keep these billy goats alive and I will start this project called Gotober, which will be trying to encourage restaurants that are on the books of Heritage Foods to put a goat dish on their menu throughout the month of October and I'll call it Gotober and we'll see what happens. So when we first started, the sort of minimal amounts of research that we did, I knew that Gotober existed, but we didn't have the infrastructure or the sort of enough restaurants on the books or anyone to kind of manage it in a sort of daily role. Uh, until about three years ago, because Hannah Blake from PR, uh, from Dining Room PR, who runs our PR and stuff, she was like, I sent her an email on like 11 o'clock on a Tuesday night in February. I said, have you seen Gotober? And she said, yeah, let's do it. So she was kind of the, the driving force behind it. And then the first year we did it, it was 2015, and we did a launch night in the Jugged Hair. And we got maybe 10 restaurants to do it. And it was a success in its own terms. We didn't you know, think it was going to blow the doors off, but we, we it was successful enough that we decided to do it the next year. And then I started working with the Food Heroes Project and we did, in 2016, we did our first uh, event in Europe, which was at the Dutch Design Awards in um, Eindhoven. And then last year I did, it went a bit crazy because we just thought, well, this is an opportunity and we're going to have to try and expand it rapidly in this year and see if we can get a foothold. So we did, we have cultivated that relationship with the guys in New York at, at Heritage Foods. So we did an event in Brooklyn, an event in the East Village, 
um, at Cairo, um, which is TJ Steele's restaurant, and Hurtas um, in East Village, which was amazing. And then we did an event in in the Netherlands, uh, in France, in Italy, in Spain, in Ireland, in London, and obviously these two in America. And we also did some events around the UK. We did one in uh, Cornwall and we did one in Manchester and we did a couple more in London. And it kind of, now it's got a bit of a life of its own. Um, and this year we'll be doing the US, um, the Caribbean. Um, we'll be doing all of the European ones again. And we're also in Australia, I was in Australia last week to sort of start the work, the process of Gotober in Australia. And I've got a conference call next week to start in India as well. Wow. Um, so the, 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 the two that are really interesting, I mean, everywhere that there are dairy, there are goat dairies, there are problems with the billy goats. Um, so the idea of Gotoba kind of gives people a free hit with the marketing and a free hit for the restaurants to give it a try. So the opportunity in Australia is to grow the domestic goat meat market. And also they are at the very beginning of having a sort of commercial dairy over there, which means they can start their commercial dairy herds without the problem that they've encountered in Europe and, and also in the, in the US. Uh, the opportunity in the Caribbean is really interesting because you'd think that they wouldn't need, you know, a 42 year old guy from Devon to teach them how to cook goat in the Caribbean. But they, but in Trinidad, the Franco I'm working with said, we only cook it one way and I want to be able to expand the way that we cook goat. And, you know, they have small dairies that are starting over there. And I think Trinidad wants to make itself like the, the food island of the Caribbean. And I think they've, They've got an amazing culture of this sort of Portuguese influence and the Caribbean influence and then the Indian influence because of the, I mean, it's got quite a dark history, but the history is there nonetheless and it's influenced the food culture. And then the Australian, as I said, have got their own domestic market to worry about. And then there's the French who want to sort of turn this million euthanizing goat tanker. Uh, and it's an idea. And the Indian stuff is really interesting because it feels to me, and I've, like, we work with brigadiers who are um, one of the best sort of Indian restaurants in the UK, in London. And they're like, their reaction to it is like, well, finally, you know, finally, we have, we have known Goat is brilliant for years and you guys are like finally coming around to it. We're really good at this and I want to show you that we're really good at cooking it. And that's a, that's a really positive and brilliant thing for us to be involved in. So we had no idea that Gotober was going to get to the sort of the reach that it's got, but it's got a life of its own. Yeah, that's a busy uh, that's a busy October for you. Then you clearly you need more Jameses in the world because you've got to be in Australia, India, the Caribbean, France. Well, I'm, I won't go to all of them, but I will go to some of them. And I, you know, I think it's important for me to be there at the beginning and help them launch yeah. it and explain what it is and kind of be the figurehead for it. And then it's something that can, as I said, we've got this small community of Midwestern farmers who can use it to help sell more of their sort of small holding herd. Mm. And we've also got these like large organisations like the Meat and Lambs Livestock Australia who are a multi-billion dollar industry who can also use it to help grow their own internal market. So it's an idea that that fits just about any use that you want. And with us, we we have a little bit of control over the sort of imagery and the word and the, that kind of right. stuff. And we can have a little bit of control over who uses it. And obviously we're happy to allow small holders to sort of use it and get on with it and, and grow it. And then there'll be some restrictions on, because what we don't want is say, large multi-retailer to start importing loads of goat and then slap, you know, goat yeah, over on it. Yeah. So, and sort of take advantage of it. So we do have a certain amount of control, yeah. but it will always be primarily, I think, for small producers to be able to yeah, use. Nice. And, you know, the, the, the centralization of the website and of the social media and stuff will help create this kind of idea that there's this global month where, you know, People can try it pretty much consequence free, yeah. and uh, and that's kind of the idea of it. Yeah, so it does feel cool. like I have two jobs now. Yeah, a proper message behind it, like you say, rather than just uh, the big brands getting on board. If you can control it by having centralised kind of uh, yeah, and the brand other, and web. I mean, who's funding it? Uh, well, it was us up until right. up until last year, and we now yeah. will get some we'll get some sponsorship. Last yeah. year was sponsored by Big Green Egg and Tabasco, which was great because it allowed us to do a bit of that travelling without it really eating into our sort of into our money and again we'll, we'll, we'll acquire some sponsorship this year for it um, and you know that's a whole new you know that's a whole new learning curve for me I don't have any idea of running those kind of big events and stuff but it has had enough success in a short amount of time to make us realise that it is um, that it is worth doing and if we like the sponsorship angle especially from someone like the MLA who are a really big sort of large organisation selling meat all over the world you know there are some questions as to whether you should take money from organizations like that given the way that they are and my if we can if we can take the sponsorship and grow goat and end the the 
all of the, all of everything we do is underpinned by a really simple mission statement. It's all the Billy goats into the food system. And you can be really pure about that and you can say, you know what, I'm going to stand here and I'm going to be strong and I'm going to stick to my morals and I'm not going to get involved with anybody that I don't think. Or you can say, do you know what, I'm a pragmatist. And if I want to get to, if I want to get from A to B, I'm going to get there in the in the easiest and best way I can. And if that requires us, uh, if that requires us creating commercial partnerships with people that don't necessarily share all the values that we do, then so be it. Because I want to get to, I'm not interested in in that particular argument. There are things outside of the goat meat industry that I'm really interested in. But my sole purpose with Cabrito is to get all the big goats in the food industry. If I can get there through pragmatism, I will get there through pragmatism. Had we adopted that sort of hardline approach, then we wouldn't have got involved with the goat dairies at all because I am an emotional free ranger and believe that animals should be kept outside and the goats aren't kept outside for lots of reasons, lots of very good reasons. But had we have been as sort of forthright with that and said, I'm not getting involved in this industry and I'm not supporting this industry, which is essentially what we're doing when we're buying the billy goats, then these animals will still be euthanized. And for me, the underlying problem is euthanizing the animals and if we have some commercial partnerships with, with some large organisations that don't necessarily share all of our values completely, I can live with that because I'm trying to solve a very specific problem. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think it's a common dilemma that people have in all sorts of industries is yeah, when when to partner up and because uh, clearly you, you know to have an impact and to get a message out, fundamentally you need money. And uh, yeah, and I'm you know I'm one guy in a van. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, you're doing you're doing bloody well. Speaking of which, the what you've created there you know not just in in a uk level but now certainly continental and then global with some of the stuff you're talking about do you feel overwhelmed and how do you uh, how do you manage that kind of sense of responsibility you or are you pretty chilled you, you, out because you you're can't, in? You, you can't you can't let it overwhelm you you know and you're right when you think about okay you've got this australian thing where they've got you know i was talking to one of the farmers out there last week said he said oh, i've got four paddocks and they've got goats in them how big is your paddock it's fifty thousand square hectares well, that's half the size of the county i live in you know, it just doesn't make any sense. To, in my head, it doesn't make any sense. You know, they've got 11,000 goats in those paddocks. You can't think about it in overwhelming terms. You've got to think, right, okay, well, that's a problem that requires this solution. Let's do that. The, the French one, there's a million goats being euthanized in France. How the hell are we going to sell them? Well, it starts with baby steps. And you do a small, you do a 200, you know, you try and bring everyone along. You do 200 goats. I know that if, I know they'll be able to sell them. And then next year we can go back and do 400. And then, you know, and you can... There'll be, I'm sure there'll be stuff happening in two or three years' time we can't even conceive of yet where you know it might be really positive or really negative. So there's no point in trying to get wedded to a single idea and say everybody needs to do it the same way. So, well, that system works there and this looks like it might work there. And you know, the Caribbean, they've even, you know, with Franca, they've got a really small operation of goat dairies over there and they're looking at trying to develop this sort of food thing with the food island and that's a slightly different. So... The skills that we have is on the marketing side, we can help there. Whereas in France and the Netherlands, there's a bit more on the farming side and they all require different things. You know, that's not daunting. It's really interesting. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. What, what a buzz. You're going to be a busy man. I think uh, action always beats intention. And I think too many people have this kind of paralysis of analysis of just going, to, how are we going to solve the huge problem? And actually just start, isn't it? Just take that first step, Absolutely. do something. Yeah, and yeah, the yeah. rest of it kind of falls into place. And people with the skills that can help will come to you. Yeah. Especially when there's a profit motive involved. Yeah, true. You know? And that is the, the big difference in Cabrito is that once you start, like we are now owned by 30% by Delamere, who are one of the two large goat dairy producers in the UK. We were taking a lot of goats from two of their farms, one of which is Will's, who we now take all of them, and Phil, who we now take all from as well. And they've gone back to their MD at Delamere and said, this guy's taking a lot of goats, you know, we should probably get involved in this. And that, I don't have a problem with profit being involved. You know, it's like, if profit is the motive that brings these people in that share that solves a problem, then happy days. Yeah, profit you know? solves, you know, solves problems all over the world yeah. fundamentally. And that's why the MLA have got involved, because they've thought, yeah. well, this guy's, found a way to market goats to a domestic UK population. Yeah. We want to do that. Let's see if we can get involved with that. And that's fine. I have no problem with that. Yeah. You know, and again, Heritage Foods in the US, they are doing brilliant things in the US food system, which is, you know, this big industrial complex. And they're doing it because they're not doing it out of the goodness of their hearts. They're doing it because it makes money and pays salaries. And that's fine. You know, you can't be too... Yeah, you need to, you need to get... 
It's pragmatism. It is, yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, if it, profit didn't used to be a bad thing, is it? We fundamentally built, you know, I don't know, the, 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 we're not nomadic anymore. We needed profit to build kind of community centres and villages yeah, and all that kind yeah, of stuff yeah, for generations. Yeah. So I think uh, it's been a very recent thing. Um, but we do have hopefully more of a social conscience now where we try and do it in a way that makes the planet better, not, well, those not make are the planet the, worse. Those so. are the, again, Caprito is a, is a, uh, is a, benefit of this but this is where the, this is where the opportunity is the opportunity is finding those areas in between large industrial agriculture and what the consumer wants that is different from what that industrial agriculture can produce and in there there's a lot of opportunity and that again goes back to what nathan atwell said about only really understanding what it is that we're good at doing you match all that up you find a, an area where you can produce a better product at a, at a price that pays you a profit that is better than is on offer from a large scale agriculture. And I also think, and this again is key, I think it's impossible to start a food business now without an ethical slant. I think you need that. I think you I think you need it because people respond to it. They need a reason to buy your product. And the fact that your product is not destroying the environment or is solving a problem that needs solving, like we are, that is a fundamental part of your marketing strategy. You know, and the ones I think that are I've never met a food producer who sat down and gone, well, I've got this really good idea about uh, a brilliant marketing strategy. Now I just need to find a product to fit to it. What they do is they find the product, they're really passionate about it, they build it up and create it and like make it as good as they can. And then they, in that, there is the story that will sell their product. And yeah. that, I think, is that's kind of crucial. And I think you can't, you know, nobody is going to be able to sell a product going, well, I've got these fantastic battery-range chickens. Do no. you know what I mean? It's, they're going to be, well, I've got this heritage breed of chicken that lives free range on my farm i grow the corn that i feed to them they put on x amount of grams every hundred and we slaughter them 100 days and they're the you know they're the sutton who they're the best chicken you can buy yeah. you know that is the that's where i think the yeah i think it's that access to information that we've got now because of social media and the internet and you you can instantaneously find out the people behind the brand and what they stand for and you know how did you get that information out 20 years ago you had to you know get a full page ad in the telegraph or something there was there was no way of getting yeah. information to the consumer um even me you know opening my hotel 15 years ago fundamentally we only managed to do it off the back of the internet because that's how I built a website and told our story whereas again you know 20 years before that putting something in the yellow pages I don't yeah, think yeah, was quite yeah, as effective one of so, a million of yeah so I think that's exciting times and talking of which and just just sort of lastly on the business aspect is there any kind of advice and you know a lot of people in the food sector but any kind of advice that you hear really bad advice or the flip side any really good advice um, from a business perspective where you hear and go that is bollocks that person doesn't know what they're talking about or you go that little nugget is amazing and you should do that my experience is relentlessness. Marketing isn't marketing isn't a special skill. It's it's being relentless, and in some stages, being annoying. You know, you just got to keep going. You know, I think you know, and I obviously you need to have stuff behind that that makes it worthwhile. You can't just keep going selling shit because it's shit. But if but like I I get a lot of stick from my partner because I spend a lot of time on. Instagram and social media, but I am there when people want a, an answer. I am always, Cabrito is always on, more or less, you know. So that is kind of my my advice would be, you just got to be relentless and don't be too precious about it, you know. Like if I'd have said, right, well, actually, no, the goats are 16 kilos because that's what I think they should be, then we wouldn't have a business anymore. You've got to be open enough to advice from people that are using your product to make those positive changes. Hmm. You know, and that's, that is a, that is a bit of a, um, a juggling trick because some advice you want to take and some advice you don't. You've got to work out which are the good ones and not. But you've got to be kind of, you can't be closed off. You've got to be open and, and be able to say, yeah, I think that's a good idea or no, I'm not sure about that. And sort of allow your product to change as the market wants it to change, not be kind of driven by a purity with it. Yeah, we have this conversation a lot in our business about um, sometimes you've just got to sell the uh, customer what they want to buy and not what you want to sell, you know, within reason, because fundamentally you've got to survive, haven't you? It's a business yeah, yeah, world. Yeah, and if, yeah, you're not, totally. if you're not still around, then you can't have all the impact and have all the positive kind of conversations that you want to have. We're actually, uh, coincidentally to this, so before I knew we were doing it, we've got goat uh, coming out on our spring menu for the first time. Okay, um, so we've cool. had it occasionally on specials over the years, but it's actually first time it's gone on to the core menu 
menu as a as, as a dish for the summer. So I'll be fascinated to see uh, how that sells. And now I feel I feel much better. I don't know why the chef decided It'll to do sell. it, but yeah, I It'll feel sell. I feel It'll, good. It's never not sold. He's, I mean, we've never had that. somebody come back and say I can't sell it. Yeah, they've done it because they don't. You know, they people have taken it off menus for lots of reasons, but never because they haven't been able to sell it. Yeah, no, good. All right. And uh, yeah, it'd be interesting. Um, talking about social media and the fact that you're you're on there and you're there to answer questions. Where do people go to to buy your goats and to find out more about what you do? Where should they head? Cabrito Goat Meat is my Twitter and Instagram handle. The the website is cabrito.co.uk and all the information is on there. We have an online shop. We courier nationwide. If you know to restaurants, we courier and we also deliver twice a week. So we, yeah, we've we've we, yeah, we're available all the time. You deliver directly to the restaurants or through? Yeah, uh, we do both. We do courier and we do deliver ourselves. Okay. And we just got busy enough to put a second central London delivery on. So yeah, I used to spend. We just taken on a driver as well, which has made wow my life so much easier. I used to do a thousand miles a week, you know, really? just up and down to London and everywhere else you need to go. Like the goats are in Preston and the deliveries are in London, and you know. yeah, I'd, I would love to. I could spend another two hours, surprisingly, talking goats with you, but <laughs> uh, but we are out of time. So, uh, but thank you so much, and, and yeah, right. hats off to you for for the dots you've connected and what you've done, and uh, yeah, really fascinating career, and good luck with with taking. Yeah, not euthanizing goats global. Uh, good luck on your mission. I look forward yeah, to well, kind of following I mean, how it goes. The, the, next, the, next, the next step is supermarkets. I mean, yeah. Again, people can get quite sniffy about supermarkets and artisan produce, but again, if you're going to solve the problem, you need that large-scale reach, and 100%. that, I think, is the next one. Yeah, good. All right, well, good luck. Uh, I'll put your website and uh, social feeds in the show notes as well. So, um, thank apologies, you, James. Apologies to the introduction. introduction it, it, the it, it, it made it all more real. They're very cute. In fact, they've done phenomenally well. <laughs> they have. Up there. So, a, yeah, you can proud of them. They've earned that ice cream. They're starting to climb up the walls a bit. I'm yeah. going to take them down the beach. Perfect. All right, lovely. Thank you so much, James. Brilliant. Cheers. So there you have it. You have reached the end of another episode of the Humans of Hospitality podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Please go and visit our website, humansofhospitality.co.uk, for the show notes and extra episodes and information. And whilst you're there, don't forget to sign up for our newsletter and to receive free materials all about the humans behind our incredible industry. Lastly, if you could subscribe, rate and review this podcast, you will be massively helping me out and it would be hugely appreciated. Thank you so much. We'll be launching another podcast in just seven days' time. Cheers. Cheers.